Television in Central Virginia started with uh, WTVR, and uh, it was owned by uh, two guys, Havens and Martin, who had a, an automobile repair shop, and they did uh, electrical work on automobiles and that sort of thing. And uh, they decided to build a TV station in one of them's garage. I've forgotten which one it was. We signed on in, in, uh, on April 22nd, 1948, as, as the South's first television station. Believe it or not, with the hundreds of stations we have available to us now, back then, uh, we were the only game in town. You didn't have uh, channels on television. In the beginning, you had one, Channel 6. You had a knob on your television set that said on, and you had one that said off, and that was it. Previous to that evening had been no television in Richmond, no one had a television. So how were people going to watch the first television show in Richmond? Uh, and so what they did was go out and acquire as many television sets as possible, 20, 30, 40 television sets that we stacked along the, the halls and in every vacant office and room here at the station and invited the people of Richmond to come in and watch the broadcast on the televisions. Well, this was back in the old days of the, the big old cathode ray tubes with huge power supplies. These things were, were big drawers of electricity. Well, we hadn't quite thought about that in the plan, so we threw the switch and we're about to uh, make the, uh, the announcement, and uh, when all of those TV sets came on and the transmitter was on and everything else, the lights, the power immediately went out. We, we uh, in effect, blew a fuse, so we were all standing around in the dark. Uh, I wasn't here, but uh, all of the people here were standing around in the dark. Some people are thinking, well, television is gonna go away. It, it's kind of radio with a picture, and you don't really need it, so it'll be here, and then it will go away. There were even others who thought, well, television might be dangerous, because now we're not just listening to it, we're gonna look at something, and this radiation could be dangerous to us. And as a result, you saw things such as uh, television sets being made with, with small screens. There were even television sets where you did not look directly into the screen. You had to look into a mirror and the, and the signal would bounce from the screen to the mirror and you would look at it that way. And people thought that would be safer, for example. Of course, the picture wasn't all that good, you know, back in those days. And uh, uh, people had the antennas on top of their houses and trying to get the best reception they could get, et cetera. And so it was, a, it was a real breakthrough in communications as well as entertainment. And you'll bet your life. Say the secret word and you'll divide $100. It's a common word, something you find around the house. Barbara Schmidt and Mario Doremi uh, A. Uh, which one is Barbara? Oh, I am. That's, that's your Barbara. That's about the silliest question I guess I've ever asked on this show. It didn't everybody have a TV in their house in those days? And all of us kids that were out playing in the yard when howdy do you like that would come on in the afternoon, everybody would go to that one person's house in the neighborhood that had a TV. We're starting at a point where less than five to 10% of the population of the United States have television sets. But then that's gonna quickly spike. It's going to quickly spike. Uh, you're going to move up in the 50s to, to, to higher numbers. And we jump up from less than um, 5 to 10 percent to immediately something like 60 percent. Channel 6 was on the air. Channel 12 was available in Richmond. There were two companies that applied for it. The people that owned WRVA Radio applied for it. That was Larison Brothers Tobacco Company. And the newspaper, the Richmond Times Dispatch, also applied for it. They owned WRNL. They both applied for the frequency. Once that happens, you have a big hubbub with the FCC so they decide which one of these companies is going to be awarded. In the meantime, Channel 8 was sitting in Petersburg and nobody applied for it. 
So the gentleman, a gentleman named Tom Tinsley, who owned WLEE in Richmond at that time, applied for Channel 8. Nobody else applied for it, and he got it. And uh, of course, WRVA radio got the frequency, and they, it became WRVA TV, which it was up until, oh, it must have been late 60s, something. The government really wasn't prepared for the, uh, the uh, huge demand in, for, for television licenses, uh, so that almost as soon as the ink was dry on our license, uh, the FCC put a hiatus on granting licenses in any market that already had a TV station until all the other uh, markets in the country were caught up. Uh, so the, uh, the good news for Channel 6 was we had almost a 10-year run as the only TV station in Richmond. It wasn't until uh, 1956 that our, our fellow uh, broadcasters here in Richmond were able to come on with uh, WXEX and WRVA-TV. So it was very good to be Channel 6 from 1948 to 1956. We were the only game in town. One thing you have to remember is we did not have remote control as we have today. You had to go up and you had to physically tune your set. Generally, that was the job of one of the children in the family. The adults would generally have the children. The children served as remote controls at one point in our history. Go change the channel. I, I remember uh, doing that as myself, doing that myself. And now Brother Johnny will attempt a series of somersaults in the trampoline while skipping rope. However, at the same time, he's going to attempt to go through that regular 22-inch bicycle hoop. This trick will be my brother's finish. <laughs> the early days of television were live because we really did not have an effective recording medium. As a matter of fact, the, the original name for the picture tube that you watch on television was called a kinescope. That was invented by, by Zorkin. Well, the earliest recording that you had in television was through something called a kinescope recording. The only way to preserve it was to uh, essentially set up a film camera in front of a monitor and shoot the picture off of the monitor of the live broadcast. Now in this take-for-granted world, love was so commonplace. But now I see an enchanted world in your face. In uh, they have a particular grainy sort of contrasty look that uh, most people immediately think, oh, vintage television. And that's, that's the only way that you could preserve um, the early days of live TV. So everything was live. The Ed Sullivan Show was live. Uh, Elvis Presley on The Ed Sullivan Show was live. He didn't know what he was going to do. You ain't nothing but and they wouldn't even film him below the waist because of his swivel hips. You didn't have any control over it. Television was more fun to the extent that you were watching something happening now. The signals are broadcast as radio impulses into space. If you talk about how television was uh, set up in a technical way, it was totally different than it is today. Yeah, everything was heavy. Um, you couldn't do, uh, you couldn't get all the artsy shots that you can get now with these small cameras and you had to have, you had to have power, you had to have lots of power, nothing ran on batteries of course. The cameras came in two pieces and one piece was the, uh, was the viewfinder, which was bigger and heavier than the entire cameras of today. They were so huge, you had to have a forklift to get them up on the tripod and it was kind of tough. And we had one camera that had a zoom lens on it and the other camera had a turret. And uh, the turret had, uh, had four different lenses on. You would change the turret to change the, uh, the, uh, the shot. Desperation was the byword in an awful lot of things that we did back in those days because there was no other way to do it. Uh, we didn't have all of the little cell phones that you could take pictures with and things like that. Uh, if, if something happened, we had to send somebody out to shoot them and that some of the equipment was cumbersome. At first, everything was done on film, 16 millimeter film, which then had to be taken to the station, had to be processed, 
and then edit it and put together to run. So it, it was a time-consuming thing. You, you, you couldn't do the news all day long because you couldn't get it on the air before six o'clock no matter what you, what you did. So you had one chance to make it work, to make it good, and you had to be good and smart and quick to do that. And the people who had those characteristics are the legends we remember from those days now. The rowboat coming up there, yeah. Sailor Bob. Uh huh. Is he getting closer? Getting closer? Yes, Sailor Bob. He's tying the boat. Okay. Gee. Maybe I'll go. I don't see anything. Uh, they didn't have electronic editing back then, so there are some there are some bloopers in there that they left them in there because, and that's what makes it. That's what you remember. Will you please let me have it? If, if editing had been as easy back then as it is now, I don't think um, those memorable moments would have survived. When you make a mistake in TV, it's there for everybody to see. Everybody makes mistakes. We put ours on TV. Uh, and uh, there, there were a lot of, a lot of <laughs> nights you'd like to remember, but some very funny stuff got on television. We were doing the Sailor Bob show. And for some reason, he had a bear, a live bear, to come in onto the schooner. And they were celebrating a birthday of some type. And the bear got to the cake, live on the air, finished off the cake, nobody else got any. So that was one of the things that uh, kind, of, kind of messed up. Is that the, where the old saying is, sometimes you get the bear, sometimes the bear? Sometimes the bear gets you, that's true. <laughs> From the information headquarters for Central Virginia, WWBT presents The Scene Tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Gene Cox. I, I can remember once I was talking, we had, on this particular day, the State Fair was in town, and somebody had gone out and done a report on the State Fair, and the opening scene was a bunch of pigs. And uh, the film got out of order, and I was talking about the First Lady at the time. And as I, I won't tell you which governor it was, but <clears throat> as I mentioned the First Lady, the screen was filled with this sow, you know. <laughs> and I cleverly said, excuse me, that's not the first lady, you know. So we had a lot of moments like that. And we still have mistakes, but it's, uh, it's high-tech mistakes now. We weren't on the air all night long at, uh, at the beginning. So I guess it was around midnight the station signed off, about a half an hour after the end of the, the news show. First you would see the flag waving and you would hear the national anthem and then it would be no background. It would just be a blank background with the flagpole and the flag waving and you would hear the national anthem and then it would go off. But it was just off. If you talk to children who grew up in the 50s and 60s like I did, one of the things that you did on Saturday morning was to get up early in the morning cut on your television set, look at the test pattern, and wait for television to come on the air with your favorite characters such as uh, Captain Kangaroo or Soupy Seals or someone like that. Judge Pike, yes. I, would you listen to me? I told you, I examined you, and I told you that don't worry about a thing, you follow my advice, you'll live to be 80. You are 80? <laughs> See? But I told you it would come true, yes. I can't. Uh, I can't be now, when you move into an environment where other stations come into your market, the playing field changes, and that's going to kind of change the the uh, the flavor of local television. I'm gonna live again. I local programming was the key to their success back in those days, and people watched it. People looked forward to it. It didn't look like network, but it was local. Programming. And a lot of it was actually very good. At Channel 8, we did a series of country music programs. We did uh, Joe Martin and the Smoky Valley Boys, and we did the Country Cavaliers, both of which were actually very good programs, if you like country, country music. In the very early 1950s, uh, the, the very first live church broadcast shown in America was uh, originated right here at WTVR. Yeah. 
they built a knockdown version of the chapel here in our studio that they, we could put up on Sunday mornings. And after the main service at Grove Avenue would wrap, the, the, the church, the minister, the choir, everyone would, would slam down some sandwiches, hop in their car over on Grove Avenue. And this is when Grove Avenue Baptist Church was actually on Grove Avenue. So they weren't that far away from here, but they would blast over here on Sunday mornings. And in January of 1952, the very first live church broadcast uh, originated from our old studios with Grove Avenue Baptist Church. Doty doty ho ho ho! Well, ho de doty, kids, and, and hey, Misty Smith. Hi, little guy, howdy. And Clarabelle, look at all the kids at home and all the kids in the gallery. What time is it, kids? Every local community had Captain This, Uncle That, and if you were to see this person on the street, it was a celebrity to you. Those are the types of things that would tie you in into your community. Every locality had uh, children's TV shows, and, and there, there are lots of them that are very popular or very well remembered in Richmond. And your dandy doodle was a neighbor of mine. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but they were puppet shows, hand puppets. My dad started in the mid-50s, and he had 12 puppets that he voiced. He had a wonderful ability to, to uh, take on any accent of, of any ethnicity. He, it was an amazing trait that he had, and he did have a signature uh, puppet, and that was Tug the Tiger. And we always chided him and teased him that Tug was really his alter ego, uh, but that really was his signature character, and uh, that's the one that the children identified with the most. Well, it was very entertaining watching my own son. I only have the one child, but he would sit and watch for hours if I allowed him to sit in front of that television. The Dandy Beagle and Superdog show, which succeeded Dandy Doodle, um, at some point was the highest rated non-informational program in Richmond. Uh, and I think he held that title for many years. His characters always had a sense of irony one in particular was the uh, nearsighted appraiser, uh, wherein there were photographs of him clearly not being able to see anything at all, just feeling his way around the car. Uh, it actually stayed on the air with us until the mid-1970s, uh, so a very long-running locally produced television show, uh, and it was really one of the originals. The Sailor Bob Show. <laughs> boys and girls, and welcome now to our TV schooner. Nice to have you with us again, and we're all set for another fine time here on the schooner, and I hope that you'll stay right there in front of your TV and be with us. Come on inside right now and join me here. I remember being enchanted, mesmerized by Sailor Bob. Um, I don't know if it was weekday mornings or just weekend mornings, but we just sit there just enchanted. And joining us on the Popeye cartoon show, your old favorite, Gulliver Go. Mr. Mouse, and the ever-popular Bluebird of Happiness, too. Uh, he was just a magician. I marveled at uh, how he could just bring these wonderful characters to life. I enjoyed being over there, see, seeing all the boys and girls and the moms and the dads and everybody. Yeah. Except I didn't enjoy seeing one guy. Who was that? The guy with a big nose over there. Who was that? The radio announcer. Oh, the radio, Mr. Bill Woody. Yeah. Well, he doesn't have uh, I don't like that nose. guy. You don't like him? No. Why? Wait, because he's, cause he's got a bigger nose than I have. Well, you, yours is called a beak. Huh? Yours is called a beak. A what? A beak. What? A beak. Say it twice. Beak, beak. Come on by. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I see. That big smile, those warm eyes, he was so engaging. Come on. Remember, yep. huh? the early bird catches the worm. Yeah, but how about that worm who got up so early? <laughs> <laughs> oh, me, oh, my, the bluebird. Silly, silly thing. It was a personal relationship between this, what they featured as a fantastic celebrity on television and we know Sailor Bob, or we know Dandy Doodle. So it was a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the children and these characters. That's what made it fun. Back then, the talent came from a lot of different, different sources within the station itself. 
but a lot of people became talented just simply because there was nobody else there. There are some interesting parallels between uh, the Bowman Body and Sailor Bob. They both started, uh, they were working at their respective television stations, but they were not on-air talent. They were on the production crew, and they were both drafted to host a show. At one point at Channel 8, the general manager, a guy named Jack Wiedemann, comes up to me and he says, we're going to put you on the air. People will listen and watch. I said, why? He said, well, he said, you've got this high-pitched, squeaky voice and funny accent, and people will think this is great. Well, nothing came of it. Then one day they said, we're going to have you do the sports, which wouldn't be real good. I'm not, I'm, I, I like some sports, but I'm not an expert at it. I mean, I know football has a pointy ball, but if you need a lot of detail, I get awful sketchy. Uh, then they said, well, we'll have you do the weather. Well, I mean, I can look out and see if it's raining, but so can anybody else. Then I didn't hear anything for a while. Then one day they said, we're going to have you host a horror movie. And I figured, well, you know, Jack's probably been in the sauce again. This will go away and it'll, be, it'll all be forgotten. <laughs> and one day I was sitting in my office, typing commercial, and two guys show up in the carpenter shop with a coffin lid. They said, stand up. I stood up, one of them stood in back of me and held up the lid, the other one looked and said, yeah, that'll fit. And they walked out. And I figured, well, you know, Jack's either serious or he's awful mad at me, one or the other. And later on, I get a notice telling me to appear for a tape session in the studio. And they had actually, without my knowing it, they had put together a nice little set and everything in the studio. And I show up and they've got this costume. They've got a guy that does makeup and he's putting makeup on me. I said, well, you know, uh, what, what, what are we going to do? I said, Jack, what do I do? And he said, well, open the lid and say hi. And I said, well, Jack, that's going to take about four seconds. What do we do for the rest of the two hours? And Jack says, I've got you on the air. The rest of the problem is up to you. you know? And that's basically how the program started. So for now until next week from the Bowman Body here on Shock Theater, hope you've enjoyed the show. Don't forget Charlie Chain. And now we'll be back uh, next week. Until then, good night. Every Saturday night I'm on your TV screen, Bowman Body keeps you awake just to mess up your dream. The Bowman Body Show was when it was on um, Channel 8, when it first came on. He hosted, uh, he was the, he had the makeup and he had the, the whole popped out of the coffin at the beginning of the show. And the Channel 8 bought a package of really bad horror movies. But it didn't matter because it's almost, the, the worse the movie was, the better the show was. Because it was all, it, you basically put up with the movie to see Bowman. And he played on it and it was just, it was just a hoot. It was uh, something that, he even beat the Tonight Show ratings sometimes because he was on opposite the Tonight Show on Friday night originally. And that, that's, that's an amazing feat for a local show. It was, it was just a campy thing um, every Friday night, 11.30, Channel 8, Bowman Body. What's he up to? A phenomenon. There was never any script, which probably comes as a big surprise. <laughs> um, uh, everything was just sort of ad-libbed and made up. And uh, WLAE Radio, which was owned by the same people at the time, had a basketball team made up of the disc jockeys. And they decided that a real good feature would be to have the Bowman body be part of this basketball team. And uh, Bob Travis, BLT was his name in the air, was on the program with me. And we were talking about, we were talking about this game we were going to do. And I threw the ball to him and he missed it. But we didn't really need the ball, it didn't make any difference. So we just kept talking. The ball rolled across the room past the camera operator who thought we needed it. So he reaches over, picks it up, and lobs the basketball back at us. And I'm talking to Bob, and I looked up, and the ball was about that far from my nose. The ball hits me in the nose and knocked me back into the coffin and knocked the coffin and all right over the back of the set. The final scene in this is Bob Travis bending over, <laughs> looking over the back of the back at this debris laying on the floor in the back, which was me. When it's over, they stop the tape, the entire crew gets up and runs over to the tape machine and says, how does it look? Rewind it, check it, look at it. I'm laying in a bloody hulk on the floor. Nobody cares about that. The big thing is, how did it look? 
Local television has an obligation to serve the public. Television and radio, that is, is part of their license. As a matter of fact, in television and radio, you are deemed by the federal government to be a trustee of the public airwaves. Having the responsibility to inform people about what's going on in the community is something I welcome, something I cherish, something I take very seriously. It's why I got into the business. People have specific memories about the events in their lives and in many instances they are tied to things that they may have seen on television. When I was a child we used to say look at the man in the moon. You would never dream of seeing the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, when I saw the landing on the moon, I, I was in master control, as was most of the station. Didn't much business go on that day when that was gonna happen. And just about every liftoff that ever occurred, people were gathered around the TV. Everybody that could would gather around to watch it. And I can still hear the drum beat in the back of my mind during John F. Kennedy's funeral. Anybody of my generation will remember dun, 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 dun. It's just kind of this droll in the back of your mind that you will remember. So uh, there are lots of events that uh, we will never forget that are pretty much burned into our memory, and that's probably a good thing. We are giving inf people information to help them make decisions about how they want to live their lives, where they want to send their kids to school, who they want to vote for, what kind of medical treatment uh, they should try to obtain. And I, I, I think it's an honor and a privilege. Clearly, people who've become institutions at various television uh, stations, um, the reason why they last as long as they do is that they have made some connection with, with people. And it may not be something that you can easily un understand or quantify, but it's there. Sailor Bob went everywhere. I went everywhere. It was not just simply a program that came out of Chicago or Los Angeles that you watched. The community was part of the program because the characters that were on it appeared within the community. It's all about a relationship. You see, without the community, we're nothing. We know that. They need us for their news. We need them to need us. And it's just inevitable that you, you cannot separate the two. When the station burned down, when Channel 8 burned down, the day that it, that it burned, there were people from Petersburg, just, just citizens and residents of Petersburg, who came out and helped carry things out of the station. And I know, you know, like, I like movies. But if I was walking down the street and I saw a theater going up in flames, I don't think I'd run in and help carry seats out. But people actually did because the station was part of the community. It was their television station. It wasn't ours. It was their television station. We didn't do the program for us. We did it for them.